the media. Today we're very happy to have with us Linda Wertheimer and her informative new work, Faith Ed, Teaching About Religion in an Age of Tolerance. Linda Wertheimer is an award-winning education writer and essayist. She was previously the education editor of the Boston Globe and a reporter at the Dallas Morning News and Orlando Sentinel. Her work has appeared in numerous publications, including Writer, The Atlantic Online, Tifrit, Moment, and the Boston Globe Magazine. A graduate of Northwestern's Medill School of Journalism, she lives in Lexington, Massachusetts. I'm not sure how good the weather is there today, but welcome to Florida. Please give a nice books and books welcome to Linda Wertheimer. Thank you, Steve. Um, if anybody wants to move forward, please feel welcome. Um, I'm so excited to be here and very happy to have some old Boston Globe buddies in the front row. I'm just curious, is anybody here an educator? No? University? No? Okay. Yes. From which one? Oh, great. Welcome. Um, what I wanted to talk about first is just why I wrote the book. People seem to always want to know that. And it actually stemmed from two things. One was a very personal experience in my own life. When I was nine years old, my parents moved from Western New York State to Finley, Ohio. Anybody heard of Finley? No. <laughs> and worse, um, we lived outside the Finley schools line, so we went to Van Buren schools. And that very first week of school, this woman came in to my fourth grade classroom. And she was carrying like a flannel graph, which they use in Bible classes in churches. And she started teaching Christian Bible study in my fourth grade classroom. And then she had to sing, Jesus Loves Me. Well, there was a little bit of a problem besides the fact that this was a public school. Um, the other problem was I was Jewish, and I was sitting in this classroom going, uh, what's going on here? I went home, and I told my parents, and they were like, well, that's not legal. And so they thought, well, we should complain. They complained to the superintendent who said, well, I can't do anything. I'll lose my job. So he offered a solution. And the solution was... Every week the church lady, that's who I called her, every week the church lady came in, I would leave. So I left each week, and my classmates stayed. And as you can imagine, they actually noticed this little nine-year-old kid walking out of the class and everyone staying. And so then that they, what they would do is they would say, well, Linda, how come you don't stay in the classroom? And I'd say, well, I'm Jewish. And my classmates would say, what's that? So I would try and explain, say, so, well, you don't believe in Jesus? And I say, well, right, I don't believe in Jesus. And they say, well, you're going to go to hell. <laughs> and, and this kind of has, so this happened in fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade, all the way through. I had kids try to convert me on the way home from basketball practice. And then mixed in with all of this were youth pastors who roamed the cafeteria trying to recruit me to come to the Christian Youth Club meetings, which still happens in a lot of public schools today. Um, and then also they had religious assemblies every Christmas and every Easter. So imagine that backdrop. It wasn't a comfortable place for me to complain about any of this. Fast forward many years later, and you know, I'm thinking about this like, was this really anti-Semitism, a lot of what I experienced, or was it ignorance? And as a child, I really thought they didn't like Jews, and that was really the problem. As an adult, as I grew more mature, I'm like, no, I think this was more about lack of exposure and ignorance. And so I kind of thought, well, would it have been better if they had taught us about many religions instead of just one? So that's sort of one reason I wrote this book. I wanted to explore that question. Is that a better approach? I mean, you're going to say, duh, right? <laughs> Hopefully. So fast forward to 2010. I'm living in the Boston area, and I catch a headline about Wellesley Middle School. They had taken their sixth graders to a field trip at a mosque, and there was a problem. A, worship, a worshiper invited a handful of boys to join the line of worshipers and said, hey, why don't you come stand with us during prayer? And so you had five public school kids now standing in the line of worshipers in a mosque. Meanwhile, there was a group called Americans for Peace and Tolerance, just keep that in your head for a second, had sent in a video camera with a parent chaperone. So all this is happening. Imagine the boys in the line of worshipers, the mother is videoing this. Well, this is the old-fashioned video. <laughs> she's videoing this. Nobody knows she's videoing this. That was in the spring of 2010. Fast forward to the fall of 2010, and out comes this video by the Americans for Peace and Tolerance that says, 
Wellesley, Massachusetts public school students learned to pray to Allah. Can you imagine what might have happened next? <laughs> Huge controversy. I think this made Fox News, CNN. All of a sudden, Wellesley Middle School has committed a mortal sin. And I was curious, so there were news stories about this, and I was curious, okay, so was this really indoctrination, or was this just a mistake by the school system? The school system came out and said, mea culpa, this was supposed to be a field trip, and the kids should have observed no participation. And they actually decided after that, they would no longer go, go to a house of worship if there was active prayer, because they just wanted to avoid problems. And we can talk about that later. I think that was probably a very smart move. But was there really indoctrination going on, which was what they were accused of? Based on the reporting I did for like the next six to seven months, I, I spent time with the sixth graders in their classroom, went with them as they went to another field trip. I don't think there was indoctrination. What you had was the teachers trying to teach the kids about Judaism, Christianity, Islam, and Hinduism over half a semester. Um, let me just pause for a second. How many of you know that it's actually legal to teach about religion in the public schools? Does every, is everybody right? Did anybody come here going they weren't sure or no? OK. There is a study that says only 36% of Americans know it's legal to teach a comparative religion class in the public schools. So because of that, I think that's part of the reason you had the controversy in Wellesley. So I went from Wellesley, I was like, well, I want to see what's happening around the country. So I went, from well, I went to Wellesley, I went to Lumberton, Texas, Tampa, Florida, and I'm going to tell you more about that since we're in Florida, Wichita, Kansas, and also California, to tell different slices of this story. I'll tell you a little bit about Lumberton, Texas, because that's one of the first chapters in the book, and it's called Burka Gate. And what happened, you have a world geography teacher and she's teaching about the world's religions as part of geography, and she thinks it's a great idea to try on clothing. So she has the kids, she puts them out on the table, and she looks for volunteers, and this had been going on for 15 years. In 2013, same exercise, and the kids try on a burqa, a kador, the boys tried on clothing that would be typical of what men might wear in Saudi Arabia, but this time something different happened. A kid took a photo, put it on, Facebook, guess what might have happened? <laughs> I see you're not back there. Yes, now we have a, another national controversy akin to what was happening in Wellesley. And once again, kind of the same tune. They're indoctrinating our kids with Islam. I think there's questions about whether trying on religious garb is a good idea, but there's nothing illegal about it. You know, I think, and, and interesting, the question isn't what people raise there. You know, what they said there is, oh, you're making kids feel uncomfortable because they're trying on religious garb, but there also should be a question about if you're trying on a burqa or a hijab, how does that also affect Muslims? Or if you're trying on a talit, which a sixth grade teacher did, not there, but somewhere else, is that, could that be offensive to some Jews? So the controversy has always looked at the effect on majority, those in the majority, but I think there's a lot of layers to this. It's not just does it offend the Christian kid putting on the burqa? Does it offend, what about the Muslim kid watching? Or, you know, just, just questions to think about. So that was Lumberton. What I'd like to do is read you a little section from the Tampa chapter, since we're in Florida. And I'm just curious, did any, is anybody aware that there was a huge controversy in Tampa a couple years ago over teaching about religion? No, okay. What'd you say? Where, where was it? I think it was in Tampa where there was a case about can you wear a burqa or not wear a burqa. And OK, um, that, that may have happened, but the one that went on, dragged on for six to seven months was over a guest speaker. I, I think you may be right that that also happened. Um, let me give you guys a little bit of a taste of this controversy in Tampa that still resonates there today. It still is causing issues. And the chapter, this is from chapter three, and the title of the chapter is called, Whose Truth Should They Hear? Every time Hassan Shibli lectures about his Muslim faith at schools, he takes listeners back to his childhood and Chuck E. Cheese's. He was a young boy eating at the restaurant with his father when the time for Muslim evening prayer arrived, and his father did what he would have done anywhere. He stood 
bowed, and began praying in Arabic. The restaurant manager walked over, bowed to, and asked, is the floor dirty? Is there something wrong there? Shibley's father said nothing. He moved into the next stage of prayer, knelt, and leaned his forehead against the floor, likely coated with pizza crumbs. Sir, does the floor stink? The manager asked as he bent down to look. Again, Shibley's father did not respond. Though the manager obviously had good intentions, an observant Muslim, Shibley's father would never break during prayer. Seven times on November 29, 2011, Shibley told that Chuck E. Cheese's story to world history and world religions classes at Steinbrenner High, a sprawling stucco-like building with a grassy quadrangle and palm trees near a pond in Lutz, Florida, a Tampa suburb. Shibley was a guest speaker, invited to give nearly 500 students a talk about Islam to complement their studies. When he stood before each class, Shibley, then 25, wore a kufi, a rounded cap many Muslims wear, and kept his curly brown beard at fist length to pay homage to a custom set by the Prophet Muhammad. Shibley, now a lawyer and imam, used the Chuck E. Cheese's anecdote to preface a lesson about the articles of faith in Islam, including the obligation to pray five times a day. We're about to learn the articles of faith. It's important so you don't end up like the guy at Chuck E. Cheese, Shibley told the students. He and his father knew that the restaurant manager was not trying to be rude and that he just didn't understand that he was seeing a Muslim in the act of prayer. Chibley delivered a PowerPoint presentation on Islam at Steinbrenner High, but it was that Chuck E. Cheese's anecdote that many teens remembered most. He gave the students a sense of what ignorance looks like, and he gave Islam a human face. Less than a month later, just the fact that the 20-something Muslim had set foot in a public high school in Tampa caused outrage. No one talked about the way Shibley engaged history students. Shibley and the teacher who invited him, Kelly Miliziano, became targets of anti-Muslim and conservative activists. Much of the ire was directed at the group Shibley headed, the Florida Chapter of CARE, the Council on American Islamic Relations, a Muslim civil rights organization that had been accused by various bloggers of having ties to terrorist groups. Um, a little aside, that's never been proven, but those accusations continue. His appearance as a guest speaker stoked debate about whose truth was okay for children to hear when the topic was religion. So does that ring bells with anyone from Florida? No. Um, this, so this controversy actually went on the entire school year. One, once word got out, it started with a father. And a father was talking to his daughter in the car. And, the, and they just mentioned Islam. And it starts, oh, yeah, we had a speaker the other day. And she didn't complain about it. She just mentioned it. And the father was like, well, where's he from? Just some group. And so then he, this particular father had heard about care, didn't like care, was suspicious of care, called the school, had a conversation with them, and they told him who, who had given the talk, not thinking anything was wrong. And then kind of fast forward a little bit, this national blogger named Pamela Geller, has anyone? No, OK. I'm trying not to get too deep into the specifics on that. Um, but there's a blogger named Pamela Geller, she also has written a book called Stop the Islamization of America. And the Southern Poverty Law Center says she is the nation's most flamboyant, prominent anti-Muslim figurehead. And so she got a hold of this, and she put out a blog that said something like, Hamas-linked terrorist speaks to Tampa High School. So that happened. Then you have this guy who was the former executive director of the Christian Coalition of Florida, who lived in the Hillsbury County school system and had grandkids. And he was very upset about it. And I spent hours with him. He said, well, he didn't really know much about care. He didn't know much about Islam. But this bothered him. So he then created flyers that said, stop Hamas-linked terrorist in Hillsbury County schools. And he would bring people to the school board's meetings. They would all wear red shirts. I'm not quite sure why red. And they would protest the existence of the care speakers. Um, but what I would say is, again, there was these accusations of indoctrination. Does anyone in this room think there was indoctrination going on from what I said? Not sure. Okay. Um, right. It was so. This was a basic. So this was a basic talk about Islam, and the teachers had brought him in essentially just to bring a human face. But there were real issues about. Do you bring an imam to speak to a public school classroom? Do you bring a rabbi? Right. You know, so do, would you bring a priest? Would you bring an evangelical Christian pastor? So it actually, they did finally talk about that. Once they got sort of through some of the big controversy, 
they talked about, well, should we have guidelines about who should speak in front of the schools? And I think that's actually a valid discussion to have. And he was, then there was a question about whether we should invite him back. You know, that's what the school was talking about. And the principal decided not to more out of fear that they would stir the pot again than whether he was the right speaker. So they never, they ultimately decided they would offer the guidelines. There are some guidelines created by education groups out there. And what they recommend is either invite no one <laughs> or invite a religion scholar who's very neutral on the topic. Just really avoid asking someone who's from a particular group that people feel have a political connection or someone who is clergy. So that, that was the big, um, that was the big care speaker controversy in Tampa. I also interviewed the students, and some interesting things came out of that. They were actually very frustrated and upset with the controversy. And the students said they felt like the adults were treating them like idiots. And what they said was, you know, we're, we're 16, you know, the students who heard this were 15, 16, 17 years old, and they felt like they could filter. You know, if someone was saying something where they were trying to convert us, they didn't feel this guy was, but they, they sort of felt like, don't try and censor what we're hearing. So the students that I spoke to, the majority of them stood, you know, supported this speaker. It was interesting, I wanted to interview a few Muslim, there were only five Muslim kids that I could find or that I could hear of in this particular school that was like a school of over a thousand kids. And I talked to two of them. And one of them was like, you know, they knew who Hassan Shibley was, they knew what care was, he was fine. The other one was like, you know, I want people to learn about my religion. I want them to understand that yes, you know, overall, it, just like any other religion, it, it, it wants peace. But I also want them to understand there are radical elements too. And I think you should avoid, the Muslim boy felt like you should avoid asking someone from care because it had controversy attached to it. He said, just make it as plain vanilla. <laughs> he just want, you know, he wanted people to learn about his religion with no controversy attached, but yet talk about the different elements of it. So it was kind of interesting to hear that. Um, I want to fast forward a couple of things, and I will allow some time for questions. I also went to Modesto, California, because that is a place where there's never been a controversy at all about teaching about religion. And they have required every high school freshman to take a world's religions course since 2000. But the reason they've never had a controversy may be they don't allow guest speakers. They don't allow trying on stuff. They don't allow field trips, and they really avoid any sort of sort of the heavy discussion I even saw in a sixth grade classroom in Wellesley. So they're very careful. The textbook devotes the same number of pages to every religion they study. They, just, they study six religion, a minimum of six religions over nine weeks' time, and they have the option of studying up to 10. So it's, it's very basic, and yet, even as I say that, I mean, I think, there, I think there's some pluses to what I saw in Wellesley and other places where they try to bring it alive. As I say that, a researcher found this, and I found this in my reporting, the kids talk about even the most basic of instruction made a difference in their lives. I interviewed this Sikh boy, um, Bupinder, who talked about how when he was five, the kids teased him because he, does anybody know what a patka, it, the little mini turbans that a Sikh, a Sikh would wear? So he wore that to school when he was five, and the kids started picking on him. So he came home, he told his mom, I'm never wearing this again. So he stopped wearing his patka to school, and it sort of changed you know, his life as a Sikh in a sense, because he was embarrassed. But when he got into high school, they actually taught about Sikhism. And he had sort of mixed feelings on whether that made a difference. And then one day he came home and said to his dad, you know, I think this is actually pretty good, because now they know who I am. And then he got to college, and he said he realized he was one of the few who really knew something about several different religions. So he felt, from his perspective, it made him a little prouder to be a sheik. And then I talked to kids on the other side, you know, who might have been in the majority or just didn't know much about the other religions, and they told me examples of how they would stand, you know, they, there'd be a conversation in their family, and someone would be making fun of Hindus. And the kid would say, well, that's not true. And he said, I learned this in my world religions class. So some of the things stick with the kids. And what the researcher found is that even if they don't remember all of the facts, it's very, it's very unlikely that any of us remember most of the facts that from courses we took in high school. 
They remember the feeling, they remember this concept that you should stand up for the rights of religious minorities, and they kind of remember things about, well, I learned about the hijab, I learned why people wear yam, and they, they learn not to look at these things as if they're strange. So, so there is sort of a good effect. Um, I would, given there are so few, I wouldn't mind having a discussion or, does anybody have any questions at this point? Yes. If there's resistance to, <coughs> I mean, forgetting about the legality of it, if there's yes. resistance to teaching comparative religion in the public schools, where do you find it more from the, say, extreme left or the extreme right? If there is a difference, if there is resistance, and if so there is a difference. I would, so a lot of people want to say it's just coming from the Christian right. And I would say that's actually not true. I do think it tends to come from the more conservative ends. But it can be conservative Jewish and conservative Christian. But not, I, I, I have not found it coming from the left. Well, so I wonder, like, if people are that religious that they have their kids in private schools anyway. You know, so, so that, so what I found... So like in the, Tampa, in the Tampa controversy, you had some very evangelical Christians protesting. You had um, the same man with Americans for Peace and Tolerance who's conservative and he's Jewish from Boston, flew down and helped protest that <laughs> there. So you had sort of those two camps. And then on the other side, though, there were also, and, and I never want to generalize because there were also pastors who came to the board meetings in Tampa and said, we have to teach about different religions so we learn about each other. So it was, it was hard. I mean, I would still say the majority of the opposition came from a very conservative element. I didn't find that as much. I, you know, and I interviewed atheists as well. Like people always are like, well, do you talk to the people who, um, you know, who don't ascribe to any religion, and what they would say is, I think it's good to learn about different religions. So I, I didn't find that so much. I mean, I think people are still really worried. They're worried more about prayer creeping in or the football coach praying on the football field, that kind of stuff. That was what we did. Um, right, and the difference, and yeah, and the difference now is, I mean, you, what happened to me was illegal. In the 70s, that was yeah. kicked out, and it's been illegal since 1963. And so now, like, my hope is with this book is that we can sort of take the conversation forward and that people will think about how can we do a better job about teaching about the world's religions and also how young can we go. I, I guess I didn't talk about that part, but there's a chapter in the book called How Young is Too Young. And if you think about the Sikh guy I was talking about, he was five years old when that happened to him. If you think about my own example, I was only nine. <clears throat> so if we're not teaching, in most places around the country, you don't teach about religion until sixth grade or 10th grade or maybe ninth grade. So what happens before then? We just, we don't teach the kids anything or do we try? Most schools don't, won't touch it. But there are some around the country that do teach about the world's religions as early as first grade. And they'll say, this is a church. This is a house, I mean, I'm sorry, this is a church, <laughs> this is a temple, this is a mosque. And then the kids will learn about Jewish stars, and they might, they'll, they'll teach them the crescent and the moon as a symbol for Islam and the Christian cross. And they'll actually cut those out. And what I have heard at times is a parent of any religion will say, I don't want my kid cutting out the symbols of the religion that he doesn't belong to. And that happens sometimes. So. Any other questions? I can read one more passage if you guys would like. Would you like one no, more? You, yes. You just talk, but most of your examples now have been about uh, Muslim conversions. Yes. I assume that's just because th this is a, an issue across the country and not not just about schools and education. Yes. So is it, do you think that, that that's just a, a common theme that eventually may iron itself out as people understand more? And okay, so the question, could you hear what his question? Yeah. So, yes and no. Um, <laughs> I think that still Muslims tend to be, and there's been a lot of op-eds in the Times and other places about this, that people tend to look at this as the foreign religion, even though there's been Muslims in this country for over 100 years. Um, I do think it's going 
I think it's gonna, it, hopefully it will get better, but I think for quite a time, it's the, the controversy is gonna be mainly over that. I have heard some, there, there have been parents who have raised objections about lessons on Hinduism because it's about many gods. And they're like, well, that's not what we believe in. So how can you teach about that? I've actually written articles about because since my book came out, there's been many more controversies over lessons on Islam. I don't know if anyone followed this recently in Virginia. They closed the schools down for a day. Did, did you hear that? No. Um, they closed the schools down for a day over calligraphy exercise. And the calligraphy, ac well, it was over the threat. They closed the schools because of threats. But the exercise was, um, it was calligraphy and they used the Muslim statement of belief. And I actually wrote an op-ed about this. Once again, there are layers to this. I th the charges of indoctrination, I think, turned out to be false. But was that the right thing to use for calligraphy? I mean, should, uh, could you use something else that might not be as hot button? But, the same but I would also apply the same thing to the Shema. I mean, should, would you have the kids write out the Shema in Hebrew? I don't think so. You shouldn't. And would you have them write out the Lord's Prayer? Or should they just learn what those, you know, these are the main prayers of the religions? Um, I don't know if you're answering your question really well. I, so I started reporting on this in 2010. And every controversy that, and we kept looking <laughs> for one that didn't have Islam in it. Because, it, because people also, in general, are just nervous about teaching about religion, whether it's Islam, Judaism, Christianity, or anything in the public schools. I've given talks where people have said, well, how can teachers possibly teach about religion? They're not trained in religion, and they don't care what religion it is. But when the controversies have happened, it's not been over the general teaching about religion. It's been over trying on a burqa. The, the guest speaker who was Muslim, interestingly, in that same school, and I write about this in the book, there was a guest speaker who came in, and he was, um, He, w he was from a sort of a rare branch of Christianity in Lebanon, a ca Catholicism. It was Lebanese Catholicism, Eastern Lebanese Catholicism. And he came in and talked, and he gave a talk where he then went off and started saying some very obnoxious things about Muslims. A Muslim boy complained to his teacher. That did not become a controversy. The teacher told the kids, you know, well, yeah, the guy probably overgeneralized, and, but it's important for us to have different perspectives. And so... You know, I, I think if it had this kid complained to his dad, you know, that just wasn't going to become national news. And I think it has to do with, you know, Donald Trump and just right now it's such a hot button. I don't, what's interesting was when I was looking at my research and reporting, these kind of controversies weren't happening right after 9-11. It's happening more now. And, and it started, there could have been things that happened before 2010, but maybe because of the internet, it just never, it never hit us. You know, we didn't hear about it. Because the con every controversy in my book ended up going viral. So, yes. I mean, amongst adults that are going on all, all over the country. I'm not sure if there was too much of it in suburban Finley, Ohio, in your day. But do you think that's having an effect, or the Nos Noscuitate with the Catholic Church and Judaism, whether that's having an effect? I mean, it could have a good effect so, on this whole you know, I, I think a lot of people will say it's sort of preaching to the choir in some, to some effect because who comes to things for interfaith dialogue? Is it the people who are coming to the school board meetings saying so-and-so should burn in hell? You know, I, I think interfaith dialogue is great because we learn about each other. I, you know, I participate in a book club called Daughters of Abraham, and it's Muslim, Jews, and Christians, and I'm learning a lot. But I would say every single person in that group didn't come in narrow-minded to begin with. So I think we need to keep doing the interfaith dialogue. I think it would be great to find a way to make it more systemic. I mean, how do you, I mean, maybe you try and get, and I think there's some efforts to do this. You try to get to some of the churches where they're kind of known for not being as open-minded. I, when I was in, um, actually, Modesto, I spent some time talking to someone from one of the big, I think it was called the Big Valley Church, and it was a big evangelical church. Here's where there's hope. And over this topic, Modesto actually got together all of the different religious groups, including the evangelical Christians. And because of that, they now have a dialogue going. And I think 
and the school system brought him in, they brought a mediator, and I think that may be where some of the hope is, if you can get them sort of coalesced around, you know, teaching the children, teaching adult, you know, both, and it might be able to make a difference. I think part, uh, let me give a little background there, because I feel like I'm talking to you back, and you have no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> In Modesto, before they created that World Religions course, they had a huge controversy. And what had happened, there was gay harassment going on in high school there, and a boy was beaten up. And the boy turned out, his parents, the superintendent knew his parents, they came and spoke to the superintendent about it. The superintendent said, okay, let's do sensitivity training. And he didn't think this would be a problem. He brought in some gay rights groups to do sensitivity training with the teachers. The evangelical churches, there were huge mega churches found out, and they got very upset about it. And there were huge, huge controversy for weeks. The school superintendent brought a mediator in, <laughs> and they had a big meeting in the high school, ca one of the high school cafeterias, with every religious group represented in Modesto, and he got them all to kind of talk about. So how can we, the fact that we don't necessarily agree on things like gay rights and other issues, how can we come together on this? And so one thing they came up with was sort of things they could agree on in terms of values. And sort of they came up with these character traits that would be okay for the kids in the schools and like civility and you know there were things they could agree on. Out of that conversation grew this required world religions course. And then you ended up with the blessing of the evangelical Christian community, the Sikh community, the Jewish community, like every religious community in the area. So I think there's hope there. But in terms of interfaith dialogue in a community and what that can accomplish, I mean, can that make a difference for the treatment of religious minorities in the schools. I don't know. <laughs> I'm, I'm, again, I worry about the preaching to the choir. You have to find a way to get to the people who are being so bigoted. I mean, what, one of the, um, am I doing on time? What, one of the things that I ran across in every place I went was fairly heartbreaking stories from religious minorities about what they're experiencing in the schools. evangelical, or do they have all three come in? So, well, so the schools that do the guest speakers try to find a way to cover all the different religions, and they may do it in different ways. Wellesley, for example, they, they, do, they do the field trip to the mosque, a field trip to a Jewish temple, and they have a Christian scholar come in and give a talk. And they decided they don't go to a church because just, you know, 90% of the kids there go to some church. So they thought it would be more useful to bring in a Christian scholar. Um, the guest in Modesto, not Modesto, in Tampa, where I talked about, where they did the guest speaker, she did bring in a Christian speaker, but it was this Lebanese Catholic, and it was sort of to show a different slice. Um, I think that's where it gets complicated. It, religion scholars, like, jump on this all the time, and they said, well, how do you know, it's not only who's the most neutral speaker, but which branch of the religion do you represent? If you bring in a rabbi, Reform, conservative, or orthodox. And so I, it's very problematic. There, there's a religion scholar, and I'm going to try not to get too nerdy here. <laughs> there's a religion scholar named Diane Moore at Harvard who, when I told her about the Wellesley field trip controversy, her reaction was, you can't just go to one mosque, that you should go to at least two examples so that the kids get a sense of the diversity within religion. She really feels guest speakers Good, having guest speaker is very problematic because it's so hard to, to show the diversity within religion. So. But, but I'm wondering how much of this is an American problem. And in your book, do you did you look at what is happening in other countries? I did not go international intentionally because I think it would have part of this because the idea was to tell a narrative story with my own story interwoven. So you do get to. I'm going to get into your question now. Um, you do get to find out what happens when I go back to Ohio. I find the church lady, I'll tell you that part. But then you get to see what happens when I meet her. Um, I, the United States is a little unusual because of the separation of church and state. A lot of other countries don't have that, so it'd be hard to do a side-by-side -side comparison, but we also felt like this was enough for the book. But uh, there are some interesting things going on in, um, I believe, England and some other countries, but I don't, but they can, 
I mean, I, from what I understand, in some countries, they're like they'll have a school that's like Christian in focus and a school that's Jewish in focus. You know, it, it's they can go a little more parochial than we ever would. So I, it's hard to do. It would be hard to do an apple to apple because we have that separation of church and state thing. You're not supposed to promote a particular religion in the school, sort of thing. Hmm? We do it in charter schools in this country. You know. Shouldn't they? No, no. There's, there's. They don't call them Jewish schools, but they're Hebrew. Are you talking about the voucher schools or charter schools? Well, here they're charter schools. I'm not sure. No, no. These are charter schools. In Florida. In Florida, there's Hebrew teaching schools, and in, in Minnesota, I think there's a Muslim leaning school. They're not called Muslim schools, but but they're charter schools. They're charter schools. They're not. That's pretty problematic. <laughs> I think it's a clear violation of uh, what's supposed to be. There's two of them. There. There yeah, that that is a problem. The um, one of a good example of a charter school in my book is in the, uh, or actually, is in, yes, it's the it's not it's a magnet school in Wichita where they teach about religion K to five, but it's not religious oriented in the slightest. I mean, I think that's very problematic, and that's getting really close to the line. I'm going to learn the Hebrew language, but. Jewish students. I mean, maybe there's a handful that want to learn Hebrew, but very, very few. I mean, was that? I think I read about that. That's a case where was it a private Jewish school that then turned into a charter? No, they just wanted to do it that way. I think that's problematic. <laughs> if you want to learn Hebrew because you want to travel to Israel, I guess that would be okay. Or you can teach. But even then, you don't need Hebrew to travel to Israel. So, are there any other questions? I think I would. Wrap it up. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. <laughs> thank you for coming. Thank you. Folks, don't forget, the book is for sale out at the counter. Linda will sign them for you right over here at the table. If you're watching online, don't forget to give us a call. We'll get a book signed for you. We'll ship it to you. Thank you all so very much for coming. <laughs>